Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the uh, afternoon session. Uh, we have uh, three talks in this session uh, to be followed by the poster session. So we're going to try to keep uh, very much on time uh, for these next three talks because uh, we have to start the poster session on time. So uh, the first talk is from uh, Simonetta Yuti uh, from UVA, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, this very, very interesting uh, nuclear photography project. So Simonetta, you have 25 minutes, and I'll give you a little bit of a warning uh, a few minutes ahead of your time. Okay, well, yes, hello everyone. Uh, so it's, it's great to be here. So um, let me start um, uh, immediately with a few motivational slides. So um, about GPDs and, and, and deeply virtual exclusive experiments. So we know that GPDs define a new paradigm. That, okay, let me switch off my phone here because uh, it's mandatory. Okay, a new paradigm that will allow us to both penetrate and visualize the deep structure of visible matter, answering questions that we couldn't even afford asking before. So this is a fact. And the questions are, so how does a proton and neutron get its mass and spin, and how do we test its dynamics? And then most recently, how do we measure pressure and forces inside the proton? This is an experiment in Hobby at Jefferson Lab. And uh, um, so the, the, the answer is in the QCD energy momentum tensor. The QCD energy momentum tensor has all the mechanical properties, describes all the mechanical properties of the, of the proton. <clears throat> so this is how it looks like. Uh, in QCD, you know, completely analogous to how we would have it in QED. And uh, uh, there's a momentum density on the uh, sides, the time components. Then we have the mass term that we've heard about this morning. And then there's a pressure term on the uh, diagonal and the shear stress components on the off-diagonal spatial components of the energy momentum tensor. So the important step that was taken Back in 1997, by Shandong Ji, the fundamental uh, step that, that revolutionized our, our, our thinking was, OK, so how does the energy momentum pro, uh, tensor look like for a spin one half system? So when we sandwich it between proton states, this is the answer that Ji came up with. So, so this is how it look like, looks like. And this is, you know, it's, 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 it's a bit of a, it's, it's a long formula. However, you can see in here that there are three form factors, A, B, and C. This is the way Ji organized them. You can organize them in other ways, and there were previous attempts at organizing this in other ways, and, and, and this is uh, history now. And so the important uh, uh, step that uh, that G made is that um, these two there are these two form factors. So there, uh, the, the fundamental form factors are three. There is a non-conserved one here, C tilde. Let's focus on A, B, C. These form factors B and C are um, form factors that require uh, all forward matrix elements of the proton. So they involve this um, momentum transfer between the initial and final proton that is, that is delta. And so, and so how do we access them? How do we calculate them? This is an energy momentum tensor. So the answer until, until um, uh, he came up with his, with his, uh, with his uh, uh, solution was, well, you know, let's look at, let's, let's couple the, the graviton to uh, <laughs> the quarks and, 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 and inside the proton, and, and, and this is, uh, we can do that, and there are calculations that exist there, and, 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 and people have been going about it uh, uh, until now, and this is still, uh, you know, an interesting effort to couple directly the graviton. But then how do we do a phenomenology? How do we get any information at all out of experiment? Well, the realization was that if you take the energy momentum tensor matrix elements, um, uh, uh, these can be obtained from generalized parton distribution moments. So the generalized parton distribution are, are the soft matrix, the soft components. So this green, this uh, gray blob in this in this graph, and you see that this graph has a left hand side and a right hand side, and the momenta and spins on the right, left hand side and right hand side are different. This is why this is an off forward process. And if you take the moments for this process, you see that so these are going to be described by a local operator, and these GPD moments are exactly coinciding with the energy momentum um, uh, tensor form factors. This was the big realization. So in order to do this, we need to realize this process. So what, what is this process going to be? It has to be a process that is that has a large momentum transfer, so deep. And here at this gray blob, this is not just elastic scattering. So it is a process in which the proton 
switches its momentum, but because it also there's also uh, a, a photon that is emitting, there's a large there, there can be a large invariant mass here at this at this at this gray blob, and so this makes it equivalent to an inelastic process. And and this process is is deeply virtual capital scattering, which you've heard about this morning a lot. So how do the uh, uh, energy momentum? How do we interpret the energy momentum four factors? This is a list of, of, of the interpretations. So we know that A, this is the, the nomenclature that comes from, from lattice QCD. So A to B, A to zero and B to zero are the A and B four factors that were listed there. And uh, um, this, this, this gives us the angular momentum. This is the GSAM rule. And then we have that A to zero by itself gives us the momentum and C to zero finally gives us the pressure. And these were calculated a while ago for flavor, in a flavor separated way for so, so the isoscalar and iso vector components <clears throat> on the U of the in, inside the proton. And so um, uh, these are relatively old results. And so there, there's been more results since then. And, and in order to, to, to summarize them, it's going to be, it, it was going to be diff difficult. However, you can look at this uh, recent review paper that, we, that was just posted um, uh, on, the, on, on the web for, for, for more up-to-date um, uh, uh, evaluations. So uh, these four factors, okay, they depend on T, which is the, 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 the four momentum transfer squared. And, and we know that from the four factors, what we want to get is density distribution by Fourier transformation. And so here, the game that we play with GPDs, it, 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 it's a bit more complicated. This is because, you know, we are accessing those internal degrees of freedom. So the graph is, is, is a little bit, you know, more complicated. The picture is a little bit more complicated. And we have two types of Fourier conjugates. The ones that we're interested in that will give us the uh, um, uh, picture of the, of the proton are uh, B and delta, the two Fourier conjugates. So B is going to be the, the transverse momentum uh, transfer that is, that is conjugate to the, to the momentum uh, transfer. And we can do this exercise. Uh, these are calculations that were done by Abaraja in this um, uh, paper that written in collaboration with Tyler Gordon and Kantiagi. So we can write the, the different four factors um, in um, uh, taking the Fourier transforms. And together with this, I'd like to, here on the right-hand side, in this, in this corner, I would like to point out this paper by Detmore and Shanahan that calculated, you know, the gluon and the quark uh, um, uh, moments and and their and their and their Fourier transforms and so this is also you know an interesting an interesting point that we're going to uh, look at later. So, uh, but but there's an issue. In order to do these Fourier transforms, we need to have a large experiment, a large range in uh, in in T, and so T has to go all the way to you know the multi jet region. And so far, so all those those evaluations that that I showed on the slide before are model dependent in the sense that we need to continue the curves uh, um, uh, in, in a region that has been not measured and has not been calculated on the lattice. So, um, okay, helicopters. <laughs> so, um, um, the JLab extra, so the, the, the C, the C uh, four factor is particularly important in my opinion, because uh, that helps us understand the equation of state of neutron stars. And this is in this paper that we submitted to <clears throat> AP Astrophysical uh, Journal Letters uh, just recently. And we can write down that equation of state. And that, with our calculations that reproduce the Jefferson Lab data, is the black curve here. So keep keep on going with the highlights. The big other highlight is the orbital component of the of the angular momentum. And several people have, have worked on this, and they're listed there. And it's, you know, now in order to do this, now you need both B and KT. So you need to go through a Wigner distribution that has both the, the transverse momentum and the transverse uh, distance uh, components at the same time. And uh, uh, um, the interesting thing is that, as pointed out in a couple of papers that we wrote a while ago, is that um, angular moment, the orbital component, is related to this Swiss tree. GPD. So, um, in in a second phase of of of, of uh, measurements, where we'll be able to access the twist three GPDs, it is going to be uh, uh, important to 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 measure this. And there's an important this, this this relation that you see here. This is a little bit of a busy 
slide, this relationship that you see here is a is nothing else than a Van Zura Vilcek uh, relation, where now the different components acquire uh, a particular physical meaning. And I can answer questions on this. This is a little bit it's flashed now. So, so um, second part of the talk. Now that I gave this, you know, motivational uh, uh, slides. Let's just uh, um, uh, see what it takes to go measure the nuclear gravitomagnetic form factors. So, in my opinion, this is a multi-step, multi-pronged process that compares to imaging a black hole. So, similarly to how the, for the black hole, we, you know, there's this event horizon te telescope that includes uh, collecting data from telescopes that can take data in a specific range all around the world and coordinating their measurements in a, in, a, um, in a very precise way to give the final image, which is this one here on the right-hand side of the black hole. And I summarize this on this next slide here. So similarly to that, so there's a main idea. There's this very long baseline interferometry is the main idea. There's precision, so you need a large aperture. You need high-frequency radio waves. And then there's data management issues. That For them, it's, it was five petabytes. But because of the location of the of the um, of the uh, uh, various telescope, it, it, it was an issue, even if it's a small, uh, relatively small amount for us now. And 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 you know, it took nearly two decades to achieve this thing. So now, for us, Jefferson Lab at 12 Jeff, we have the main idea. We have to coordinate all these experiments: DVCS, TCS, DVM, DVMP, and related processes. We need precision and high luminosity, and a wide kinematic range is key. And Jefferson Lab at 12 Jeb guarantees this. And, uh, and then there's a data management issue. And here we have an unprecedented amount of data that need new you know, artificial intelligence-based techniques to handle the imaging making. And in the course of 10 years, look at all the experiments that are listed here, uh, we, will, uh, we will accomplish the first proton image. This is my, my view. So um, a step in this direction is the Center for Photography. So we have a new director, that's Shandong, and, 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 and here are the steps that took to create it. So there was an initial meeting at UVA in December 2018 with a uh, also historical <laughs> snowfall. Then in uh, uh, summer 2019, there was a series of pilot projects that was uh, funded by Sura. And in, in summer 2020, now finally, you know, we have a director and, and, and we are fortunate to have, to have Shandong. So um, these are slides. <clears throat> that I that were uh, uh, given to me that by by, by Shangdang. and so um, so the Center for Nuclear Photography has funded different uh, aspects, and so this will cover different areas: experimental data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, inverse problems, lattice calculations. The total funding so far from our governor has been um, just half a million, uh, and 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 uh, um, we are looking to more in in the future. And now it is time to organize different efforts into a larger collaboration involving people outside Virginia just as well. So the goals of the femtography, again, this is a slide from Chandog, is to provide the most up-to-date, accurate information on GPDs through all the available experimental data, nuclear models, and so to harness information in a, in a, in a user-friendly way. That is where I, I, you know, I, I will put the accent on. And then use it to picture the nuclear in multiple spaces and variables. And, and explore the significance of the GPD photography and the fundamental properties of the protons, such as mass and spin. So there are coordinated directions. So there are very, very various people involved here, and I don't, didn't have enough space to list them all on this one slide. And uh, uh, and these are uh, the, the points that are that are um, highlighted, and you can see this. So um, so how do we harness coordinated information from all of the channels? Here you see DVCS, TCS. Double DVCS and also a very interesting channel is uh, exclusive pion induced Dralian. This is out of you know reach of of, of um, Jefferson Lab so far. So it's it's it's, it's more of a J Park type of experiment. Plus the dot dot dots are for all the DVMP type of, of processes. So so we need to start from a robust framework for the cross section where um, the kinematic limits are under control, and so we need to really step beyond the harmonics model. The harmonics picture is just a model, and, we, and it, it, it is time to, to calculate the cross-sections for the various processes exactly. This is what we did in this FISRFD paper. We have an exact calculation of the cross-section. 
and, uh, and, and you know that DBCS comes together with, the Beth, with its Beth Heiler piece, and this is both a blessing and, and a tricky problem to, 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 to deal with. Uh, and let me, let, me, let me illustrate this a bit. Um, this is how I focus on the unpolarized cross-section. This is for DBCS. This is how the unpolarized cross-section data look like. There's this phi dependence here. Phi is, uh, is hardly visible here. This is a phi azimuthal angle. Angular dependence, as you've seen a lot this morning, just as well. And there are, and these are how these different components uh, contribute to the phi dependence. But the question is, what is the phi dependent, the correct phi dependent? So this is how the DBCS cross section looks like. It looks don't 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 be you know don't be like um, uh, horrified by this slide. <laughs> it is just exactly the same form as the TMD uh, slides. So we have our twist to GPDs, our unpolarized, longitudinally polarized, and transversely polarized target pieces, and and the various twist to and twist three GPDs contributed at all at all levels. And and the interesting part of this slide is exactly that we can model it exactly like in the TMD case. So then the Bette Heiler piece, well, for the unpolarized, uh, we uh, cast it in this form, which is reminiscent of the um, uh, elastic scattering, and it's just, it's, 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 it's completely analogous. And uh, um, compared, uh, and compare this, so this is a simple form, if you think about it, there's A in this form, and there is B in this other form, and it is completely analog, I mean, it's, it, it, it is, um, you know, a big uh, uh, simplification to what we had to deal with in the harmonics uh, formalism. Although in this case, <clears throat> the results in the end uh, are, are are the same. So uh, the important part, and this is, is the beta heter DBCS interference term. I would like to demystify with this talk the fact that we get the GPDE only from the AUT type of um, uh, observable. That is true. We get it from the AUT observable, but that's not the only one. Um, uh, if you if you look at the formalism in a more complete way, you see that there is this. You can you can separate out the mm, beta area DBCS interference term in a way, again that is reminiscent of your elastic cross section. Because we have to remember here, this is something that I would like to say here loud and clear, that DBCS and all these related experiments are exclusive experiments. So they have a lot, a very much in common with elastic scattering experiments and coincidence experiments. They're, they're, they're just coincidence experiments. So, so this is the way that they should be viewed. And if you see it this way, you see that there is a part that is similar to the F1 square plus tau F2 square part. And there is a part that has the GM and H plus E. I remind you that H plus E is the analogous of the uh, elastic form factor GM. For if you bring it, if you, if you if you if you consider this in terms of, of GPD form factors, so H integrates to F1 and E integrates to F2. So this is where we get H plus E in the unpolarized scattering experiments. And in order to do that, and and and, and so 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 okay. So um, um, the other aspect about calculating the formalism, uh, um, calculating the formalism uh, exactly is that it has an impact on the Q square dependence. And here I show in these two slides how, you know, when you go from the um, uh, complete formalism to the approximated formalism, um, you, you really, you know, could, could, could be messing up the interpretation of the Q squared uh, dependence. So we see, you know, like uh, uh, the, the logarithmic slopes that we, um, that we can uh, calculate that with our with our PQCD uh, uh, evolution code. So um, so how do we get the H, H plus E out of experiment? We do a Rosenblut separation. So we, we transform that complicated phi dependence into linear plots. So just analogously to how the data <clears throat> for the elastic form factors back then in the Ofstadter days. Uh, where were transformed into Rosenblut separated data. So um, the variables now are going to be these ratios of these A and B uh, uh, kinematic coefficients. And the, the, you see that the intercept is going to give us the real part of H plus C. E. So let's look at some results. So um, um, this is the real part of E, the, the blue dots that we extracted from the data, and we compare with Kumerichki and Mueller's <clears throat> evaluations. Um, uh, and 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 uh, from their neural network and 
ex extraction analysis, and uh, um, this is a real of E, and this is a real of H plus E. So, extracting information from data with standard methods is painstakingly slow. So, how can we use machine learning, artificial intelligence? I like to show here on this plot. Uh, so this is where, where we started collaborating with the uh, you know data science uh, at, at UVA and, and Matthias Burka also joined our effort. So um, I like to show this plot, um, which is a, which is an arch typical, is almost their poster child <clears throat> of the neural network PDF analysis, where you see that you see that this is the green thing is is their is their prediction and 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 um, uh, their completely unbiased prediction. The blue and the red are from other groups like CTEC or, or MRS, MSTW or, or, or the Al Yeking and, 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 and company extraction, which used uh, a, um, a, a functional form. So, so you see, because they're tied to this functional form, well, their error prediction is also smaller. If you just give up the functional form completely, you want to be completely unbiased, you're going to be able to predict only where you have data. If you don't have data, like it was here in this, in this region of very low Q squared, of, uh, sorry, of very low Bjork and X, this is Bjork and X on the X axis, um, of very low Bjork and X, the, the neural network cannot, um, uh, cannot predict anymore because it's, it's, it's based on a supervised algorithm and, 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 this is, and this is what the issue is. And so there are many, many ways. There's been many studies. These people are deep, have been deep into, into, into understanding this issue and how to go about it. So uh, this is, um, uh, uh, you know, what we try to do for, for GPDs, what we are doing actually for GPDs at, 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 at UVA. So we're using deep neural networks for, for, for regression, so for a regression problem. And uh, 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 this is a, a scheme here of, of our, of our uh, um, 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 uh, process procedure on the, on the, on the right hand side. And I'll leave you to uh, uh, to read this and 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 uh, um, uh, move on to the next slide. So these are our results. So what we what we trained our network on was to learn the phi dependence, and these are the results again for the UU and the LU data in in one case. And uh, um, and so how do we go about with the error? Well, so estimating uncertainty is the main issue. So you see that uh, um, when you uh, move from the region where you know where the data are, which is this region here, for instance, you have very sparse uh, uh, data so far, and you move away from it, then then you know the uncertainty is going to is going to blow up, and and uh, um, and so the the way that we've been going is going to blow up. However, even within the supervised uh, um, technique, we can. Um, uh, introduce some uh, some uh, 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 technicalities here that that that, um, that I will not go into, and and try to push the, the the network to understand further what goes on further away from where the data are, and this is summarized in this graph here on the left hand side. So you see that the error. So we want to be in the purple zone where the error is is the smallest, and you see that. Uh, um, uh, this is the region where the black region here, the darkest region, is where the data are. So from this graph, what we understand and what we are understanding now from our neural network study is that um, the, the net, we can understand what goes on away from the data in the, in the, um, as far as the t-dependence. So the t-dependence seems to be, from what our network is telling us, and this is extremely fascinating to me, it seems to be um, um, known. So it seems to be um, easier to predict. Is this going to be like a form factor? Is this going to be like uh, um, decreasing like an e to the minus bt? This we're still, uh, we, we cannot still uh, pinpoint these two types of dependencies. However, what we see is that it, it, is, it is, we can clearly extend our predictions beyond uh, uh, where the data are in an easier way. While for the xe dependence, we lose signal much easier. So the xe dependence is where things are going to be trickier. And, uh, and, uh, um, and, and, and okay. And so, um, so again, this procedure, we, we are in the process of writing a paper and the model will be open source and so hopefully it will be available to everyone. So um, uh, one last thing, 
that I wanted to say about uh, um, using machine uh, um, machine learning is that another way of, of going about this is to uh, move from a supervised algorithms to unsupervised algorithms. And we're in the process of doing this, but the results that we had, so this is just, it, it was too, too fresh baked out of the oven. And so I didn't feel like doing it um, here to you. But if we use unsupervised algorithms, we, um, we get to learn um, a bit more. Anyway, this is for the, for the future. So, um, moving so on. Yes. I'm, I'm almost done. Almost done. So moving towards the EIC, what we need is glue on GPDs, and this is the state of the art. Brandon, Kristen, and Philip uh, Vili, who is a, a an undergrad, actually, a very talented undergraduate at the University of Virginia, have been working on on, the, on extending our model to the glue on GPDs. I just flashed these two intermediate results. And so, what finally, before I get to the conclusion slide, what I left out is nuclei, so helium-4 and the deuteron, they're like immensely interesting, immensely interesting for both, for either, um, the two nuclei are, are, are very interesting for, for two, uh, for, for different reasons, and I can answer questions on this. And then finally, my, um, this is a, a project that's dear to me, because is piezo reactor production as a means to access um, transversity GPDs. That's also something that is extremely interesting. And then finally, the connection with the flavor separated elastic form factors. So one point that I would like to say is that um, when we talk about, uh, there, there's not just DVCS type of experiments, all experiments, so GPDs are hybrids, right? Of, 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 of uh, uh, form factors and, and partner distribution functions. And so, um, and so all information from all experiments has to be harnessed to eventually give us this, um, this image. So conclusions. Jefferson Lab at 12 Jeff will make history. As we uncover there's the, the, the mechanical properties of the proton and observe spatial images. So to observe, evaluate, and interpret GPDs and Wigner distributions at the subatomic level requires stepping up data analysis from the standard method. And uh, um, developing new numerical, analytic, and quantum computing methods, for instance. And, and this, is, this is why, this is what the Center for Nuclear Femtography is all about. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Simonetta. Uh, I had uh, one question. Um, I know that uh, as part of this effort, there has been uh, there's been some motions in getting people from uh, other communities, the computer science community, the computational science community uh, involved in the project. Maybe you could comment a little bit uh, about that. So sorry, sorry, say it again. Uh, so I was just asking about involvement of people from the computer science community or computational and data science community. Yes, I could not, I could not list all the names and all the efforts uh, of, of the people that are uh, involved in this. There is, a, there is a heavy involvement of, uh, so the, the, the three main universities that are working on this now, are um, uh, uh, ODU and there's Nikos Chrysokoides at OBU that has a ODU that is uh, that has a tessellation method to, to go about this. Then there's CNU, so th there's a, an effort uh, that is headed by um, David Hedo, and uh, and there's UVA and and UVA has a new uh, data science uh, school of data science, and so the the the, the physicist. That is also there's work in there in the data in the school of data science with us is Pete Alonsi and so we are uh, we are working with them. Plus there are more uh, uh, efforts that are that are just I would say just budding efforts and so so I I um, everything is pretty much starting up, but there has to be so we're not as physicists we have to put our ego <laughs> that is that I heard from. Uh, and I remember who our ego on the shelf. We have to put our ego on the shelf and and, and embrace collaborations with computer scientists and uh, and data scientists. This is this is what, what what we'll have to what we'll have to do. So we started doing this at UVN, and so did the, the Charles Hyde at at uh, at, uh, um, at ODU. And and I hope that this effort will keep on being. You know that these efforts will keep on being funded. It, it, it seems like, and 
so definitely the the collaboration with computer scientists and uh, 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 data scientists is key. Uh, th this is this is this is clear to me. Uh, without that, we, we as physicists would do an amateurish kind of kind of effort, which okay. Uh, might have his merit, but 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 uh, but it's definitely uh, we need that kind of professional input. So thank, thank you very you. much. I appreciate it. If you can stop uh, sharing your screen, yes. Uh, now. And uh, our next talk uh, is from Paul Souter, uh, and we've heard a fair amount over the last couple of days mentioned uh, about the Solid Project, which is a, a, a massive effort uh, going forward and a big part of the future of the lab. Uh, and so Paul's going to give us, I guess, sort of basically an update of, of uh, where things stand with Solid. Okay, so Paul, go ahead. Uh, we see your screen, so you can start sharing and go ahead. Okay, you see my screen in the what looks like the right slide. Uh, it looks like it's just your uh, yeah. There we go. Uh, you can click on that uh, hide button top there. Uh, that helps. I think people can see it in any case. Perfect. Okay. All it right. says the future solid program. Okay, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about where. Solid is going. We've been doing a lot of work on it for a long time. Give you a brief outline. We'll talk about the physics reach of solid. We'll talk about the, <clears throat> some of the details of the experiment. And finally, talk about the status of the experiment at the moment. The basic idea is we have a new catchphrase for it. QCD at the intensity frontier. The idea is to use the full expo exploitation of JLab 12 up -jab, 12 jab upgrade in order to ma maximize the scientific return. We have both large acceptance and high luminosity varying from 10 to the 37 to 10 to the 39, uh, depending upon the experiment, hence the term intensity frontier. The, Basically, there are three uh, main efforts uh, for the program that are fairly different. One is the CITIS program, trying to reach the ultimate precision for tomography of the nucleon in the valence region. Uh, this picture on the left uh, shows what some of the data might look like. Uh, the CITIS data is a function of many variables, and uh, Hence, it's important to have a large set of data in order to uncover everything that's going on. Uh, the second topic is uh, PBDIS in the high X region, provides sensitivity to new physics, and also surprises <clears throat> unique probes of hadronic structure. Uh, finally, the third program is JSI production at threshold. Uh, I'll say a little bit about it, but I'll probably say less. And we already heard about this morning in the very uh, interesting talk on the uh, Paul C experiment looking for this. Uh, I'm really anxiously waiting to see the data from that. Um, they, they left out all the good stuff in what they showed, but at least they explained why you can't uh, release data before your collaborators have said you know what you're doing. So that's very important. Okay, to put the project in. Perspective, I'll just mention one recommendation, recommendation, recommendation four from the 2015 long range plan. We request, we request, we recommend increased investment in small scale and mid scale projects and initiatives that enable forefront research at universities and laboratories. So SOLID is a uh, mid scale project that fits within that domain. Okay, so one important subject at JLab is three-dimensional uh, nuclear structure. There's sort of two main approaches for this. One is general parton distributions, which I won't say much about, although SOLID does a bit on that for those interests. Uh, one of the main focus is uh, transverse momentum parton distributions in order to get a three-dimensional picture of what's going on. 
Uh, the interesting feature here is that it turns out with CITUS, when you see a pion coming out in addition to the electron, it turns out to give you a fairly good picture of the transverse momentum of that quark, which is very important. And also by using a number of tricks, you can also get the transverse spin of the struck quark and hence see all the correlations of, of these different vectors. And like this picture on the right sort of illustrates the thing, the effects are very big. If nothing were going on, if the nucleus were a <clears throat> state like hydrogen, there would be nothing. It would look like this picture on the left. In fact, there's all kinds of interesting and fun structure going on uh, <clears throat> that we intend to probe. And just to give you a, a brief review of many different structure functions, there's the Sivers function, the transversity, those are two that we'll say the most about, also bohr muddler uh, pretzelocity. And again, the idea is you have quark spins, nucleon spins, and transverse momentum, and all the different combinations that you have uh, give these many different functions that all can be cleanly separated by measuring their kinematic uh, dependence. I'll spare you the formula. Uh, a big thing about solids work on this, it should be a major improvement in the precision. We have two graphs on the right. One about transversity, the other about divers. Uh, the you have both an up and down course, up in red and down in blue. And the uh, present uh, error bars from Hermes compass and fits with uh, <clears throat> E plus E minus annihilations uh, give you the fat bands and the narrow bands is what we project we should be able to do with solid. Uh, again, both systematic and uh, statistical uncertainties are included. The bottom panels uh, give you the increase in precision, and in some cases, it's as large as a factor of 30. So this represents a major step forward. And there's a nice publication describing how this works. Hitting the wrong button here. Okay, this is the button. Okay, moving on to the PVDIS program. Um, there's sort of four main topics. One is a beyond the standard model test to look for new physics. One example might be a kind of a Z prime that doesn't couple to electrons. And one diagram that allows you to see what's going on is it would couple to photons. Uh, <clears throat> this would give a vector piece here, an axial piece here, to make it parity violating. This diagram would come into effect. And this is the unique thing that solid measures. No other experiment can measure these C2s precisely. Another example is charge symmetry violation. These formulas assume that the up quarks and down quarks, <clears throat> the up quarks and the neutrons and the down quarks and the protons are the same. Uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, we can also see a higher twist term not involving gluons, which is a unique feature. And finally, there's been a lot of interest in uh, measuring D over U and uh, all the different methods. They all have some very interesting nuclear physics in it. And here we can do it without any nuclear physics at all. And maybe we can learn both something about nuclear physics and learn something about the D over U ratio. Okay, to say a little bit about uh, looking for physics beyond the standard model, there's sort of a new buzzword that everyone's using, has been around for a while, but it's basically standard model effective field theory. And the idea is you have a Lagrangian that looks like this, and there's a new thing in that they're using both dimension six and dimension eight operators these days. And the idea is in order to constrain as many of these coefficients here called Wilson coefficient as you can. And solid measures, are a lot of different names for them, C2s, uh, G2s, or whatever. Anyway, these are, this will provide a unique, uh, it's one combination of the CIJ6, the, the dimension six operators, and we will make a unique constraint on that and provides a, a probe of the standard model on a plot for um, the C2s and the C1s. Um, there's been a recent progress. Uh, 
one on the C2s, the best limits on the C2s, which is in the vertical direction, comes from this nature paper, another nature paper, 2018 from Q weeks, that's the other direction. And uh, the goal of solid is to make a big increase, <coughs> uh, ruling out the, the possible phase space that's indicated by the yellow. Okay, moving on to uh, JSI production. Uh, we saw these various uh, pictures before in the in the previous talk about the uh, um, the data we have going down to the threshold. The interesting physics is is basically this uh, energy momentum tensor, and uh, in picture in particular the trace anomaly contribution to it. It's it's a very important thing that. It basically tells how hadrons interact when they have no quarks to exchange. Uh, the JSI and the proton have completely different quarks, and, and that makes the physics rather different. And again, the important thing is the real amplitude, and the idea is the real amplitude dominates uh, near the threshold, and near the threshold, the cross-section goes way down. So that's why you need a lot of data. And again, you have both an important T dependence and uh, <clears throat> with electro production, you get a Q square dependence, and by collecting all these data, we can uh, <clears throat> have access to the trace anomaly, which is one of the uh, unique things that contributes to the proton mass. So we're looking forward to this, although uh, <laughs> if you're not very patient, we're looking forward to the publication of this uh, Hall C data. And again, we heard about the LHCb pentaquarks, which would sh potentially show up as bumps. And again, when you're looking for bumps where the models don't tell you how big they are, lots of luminosity is very good. And as we also heard this morning, uh, having T-dependence is very good because the parts of the T-dependence where there isn't much signal, uh, that's where you look for the pentaquarks. Uh, so this is something uh, we're looking forward to. Okay, um, now the other thing is this program with the JSI, there's a complementary program at the EIC with the Upsilon. Again, the Upsilon has different quarks. It, it's higher mass. Um, they can see that, we can see this. And the proton only has one trace anomaly. So the exciting thing about this is we do two different experiments with two different particles. And if we see the same trace anomaly, we might believe that we understand the trace anomaly. So basically, you need to really know what you're doing. You need both the EIC and solid. So again, the programs are quite complementary. Say a little bit more about the <clears throat> synergy between solid and EIC. The proton mass we talked about, um, and the proton spin with the TMDs, 3D imaging. And then actually, there are some parallels in the experimentality. Technique, streaming readout, machine learning for tracking large scale DAQ. Uh, <clears throat> Solid will be uh, taking data before the EIC, and presumably some of the people that uh, will be working on the EIC will be trained on what we're doing in Solid. So people are interesting, interested in joining the EIC, but want to get some papers out before the EIC is taking data. Uh, Solid is a good opportunity. Again, with the EIC, it's actually the energy frontier. The luminosity is a bit lower, but the energies go much higher. The lower energies, they have synergy with what solid is doing. At the highest energy, they're studying stuff that's inaccessible to JLab. So yep, you do get something for the energy, but the synergy is quite important. And again, for the TMDs, the idea is you want to measure the TMDs at all Q squared, low Q squared, and high Q squared. And the EIC does a good job at the low Q squared. Solid does a good job at the high Q squared. So together they cover the whole range. And for many things, the whole range is important. OK, so the apparatus is shown here. There are two configurations and uh, two different pictures. The one on top is actually all set up for CITIS with a uh, polarized helium-3 target here. And the particles go throughout the entire solenoid and then hit the various detectors. For solid PBDIS, we have a hydrogen target in the middle of the solenoid. 
and focus on much light, larger angles. Now the luminosity is large at the 10 to the 37 to 10 to 39 level, the high data rate about as high as we're able to take. Backgrounds are also very high, we have to manage them. Now the precision data, we have to have very low systematics. Another fun thing is we have high radiation, we have to make sure we understand all of that. The large scale, sort of on the size of RIC detectors, and it uses a number of new technologies and pushing the new technologies, including GEMS, Dashlik Eek calorimeter, and pipeline data acquisition system. Okay, so say a little bit about the timeline uh, since 2010. We've had five experiments approved, uh, three CITIS, uh, and there have also been uh, five additional run group experiments approved, and we're hoping to add another one this summer. Um, things really started moving in 2013 when we uh, requested the uh, CLIO-2 magnet, which is the heart of the apparatus. It was agreed, and it arrived in 2016. And various pieces kept coming. Finally, the final pieces uh, arrived last year. In 24, we submitted uh, a pre CDR to JLab with cost estimate and schedule based on Hall D and class 12 experiment. 2015, we had a director's review, which was positive, but had many recommendations, which gave us a lot of work. Uh, we submitted an updated pre CDR in 2017 with responses to the recommendations. In 2018, uh, the DOE uh, welcomed us to give a, a visit and discussion of what's going on. In uh, 2019, we updated the cost estimate and updated the pre-CDR again, submitted it to JLab. In uh, <clears throat> last fall, uh, we had the full WBS uh, set up in a more detailed structure, uh, <clears throat> and we had the director review, uh, a, a director's cost review, including all this structure and proposed schedule. Uh, <clears throat> last November, a very exciting thing, we had a pre-R&D plan that was actually funded. Uh, the DOE has uh, now put money into this, uh, new money, which is very good. Uh, again, our pre-CDR was uh, converted to an MIE, which was submitted to the DOE after approval from the lab uh, in 2020. We're hoping to have a science review soon, uh, late 2020 or maybe 2021, and then going through the, uh, what we hope to have with a CD0 uh, process, uh, maybe second quarter of 21, CD1, uh, first quarter of 22, 3, 4 would be in 23, CD3 in 24, and CD4, the whole thing done by 28, after which we'll be able to start taking data. Okay, so the apparatus has a number of systems. Again, there are two different configurations. One is um, PBDIS and the other is CITIS. The heart of the PBDIS is since we're only looking at one particle, we could can put in baffles that allow the one particle to go through. They block everything out. This gives us the uh, large uh, acceptance. We have a light gas Cherenkov counter to uh, distinguish the electrons from pions. We have five gems for the tracking and an E calorimeter together with uh, <clears throat> Cherenkov enables us to identify the electrons. Um, for the CITIS, um, the um, electron calorimeter gets divided into two pieces, one large angle, one small angle. In addition to light gas Cherenkov, we have a heavy gas Cherenkov uh, <clears throat> uh, to reject kaons and maybe pick up some of them. Uh, we have an MRPC uh, to get timing hopefully even to detect kaons, so we can do CITIS with kaons. And finally, we have scintillators to reject some of the background. So that's the whole system. Um, another thing that's happening is that 
uh, these big experiments uh, require some rather elaborate software. And actually, there's a new thing that people are talking about called DD4HEP, uh, which we're starting to look at. This allows both simulation and reconstruction with the same framework. You don't have to <clears throat> re-enter your geometry in order to do the reconstruction. And here's a beautiful picture that we have. It happens to be a JSI event, and it shows that uh, this software exists. And <clears throat> it's uh, something we're uh, looking into very closely. And it's also a candidate for the software that we'll be using for the EIC. Again, the closer we can parallel with stuff going on to the EIC, I think the better it is for everyone. Okay, now a little bit about our R&D uh, plan, uh, which was, uh, again, recently funded. There are two parts. One is electronics. On the left is shown. This is basically the, the JLab FADC electronics, but there are a lot of features that aren't used by everybody. And in order to put everything together, uh, we're going to use all the fe features. And, in fact, we're starting to bench test them now. Uh, second important thing is our terrain costs. We have two of them. We need to push them as uh, as hard as we can, uh, <clears throat> including multi anode PMTs, wavelength shifter summing, and Marat electronics. And uh, we actually have a setup in Hall C now. We've already taken some data, and uh, <clears throat> things are looking pretty good. And we'll continue to study this. Okay, um, you're welcome to get involved. Uh, easy way to get involved is to uh, contact with someone uh, here or the uh, of our leadership structure. It's the easiest thing to do is if you have friends on this thing, contact them. Otherwise, contact JP or anyone in our executive board. Uh, this thing will be ramping up, and there'll be lots of uh, interesting things to do. And maybe a few words about the recent pro progress uh, in simulations and software. Um, with the gem detectors, basically, we probably will need a new readout. Uh, VMM is the is perhaps the, the one of choice, and this is the uh, the hardware that we're testing now as part of our pre R and D program. We've been doing various background studies. Uh, Simulations supporting the Trenkov tests that are going on, uh, in tuning our development of the end-to-end -end simulation, and uh, again, uh, JSI, we're doing a case study with this, and we're working on hadron generators. Uh, the detectors, um, again, the light gas and heavy gas uh, counters we're testing. Uh, <clears throat> We're also working on the gas handling system and the window study for the heavy gas cheering cough, which has to be uh, pressurized. Uh, we're testing the gems with a new readout system. And again, we're <clears throat> optimizing the efficiency of the of the ECAL. On the DAQ side, we have uh, support from the JLab DAQ. We're dividing a readout board with the BMM, the gem readout. And um, we're setting up a prototype test scan, test stand, and we can test the, the uh, rate limitations of the FADCs and the readout system for the time of flight detector. Okay, so in summary, we have an exciting, varied physics program. It's a state-of-the-art apparatus. It's a gateway to the EIC. And now is a great time to get involved in the project. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, appreciate uh, the uh, full coverage on what is obviously a massive project. Uh, I'm just looking at the Q&A here. I guess uh, did such a wonderful job of covering everything that people understood. Uh, all aspects. Uh, I had one question. You mentioned uh, the pipelined uh, DAQ. Uh, and 
Hello? I'm sorry, I was muted. Oh, okay, it's easy to do. Okay, uh, the question that I had, uh, you had mentioned the pipeline DAQ, uh, and I know obviously there are a lot of people that are working on streaming readout, and we're gonna have a talk about that tomorrow, but I was thinking that, that Hall D and Gluex have for a long time uh, been pursuing you know, pipeline DAQ efforts. Is that something that can be leveraged for solid going forward? Oh, it's what we're using. We're just, they build in more features than these other experiments are using, and we're going to use all the features. That's the difference. Basically the same stuff. Right. So if people have experience with that, uh, their heads up if they want to. We certainly have room for more users to get involved in the DAQ. And again, it's stuff that uh, some of you already have some uh, very useful experience in. But, you know, we'll be doing more. We're connecting more stuff in different ways. All right, very good. Thank you for uh, keeping on time, and uh, thank you for a, a, a very full coverage of what is a massive project. Uh, and as I said, it's very important to the future of the lab. So it was, it was great to hear about it. All right, I guess we will uh, move on to the uh, next presentation, uh, which is uh, from Le Ping Gan, uh, who's going to talk uh, about uh, Essentially, uh, all of the experiments and future ideas uh, having to do with uh, understanding uh, the ADA uh, at Jefferson Lab. So we see your video. Uh, be able to I can see your video. Uh, I don't see your screen yet. Oh. It's on the right hand side. It looks like the Windows image icon. What about there you now? Go. Yes. Okay. And just up at the top of the screen are, uh, if you could click the hide button, up the blue jeans bar at the top. Uh, okay. Is that perfect. Good? Yes, perfect. Thank you. All right, go ahead. And um, I would like to thank uh, the organizer to, oh, I can't go back. Sorry, something is wrong. Okay, so I would like to thank organizer to give me uh, this opportunity to talking about the primitive measurement on Pi Zero Eta Eta Prime. So I will first uh, give a um, brief introduction about why it's interesting to do such kind of a measurement. Then I will talking about the uh, experiment. So as we know, no energy QCD represent uh, the last uh, frontier in standard model because of uh, its uh, non-perturbative uh, nature. So the night uh, to the scalar meson pi zero eta eta prime actually can provide us a sensitive probe to attack some of those issues. In the chiral limit, when you turn off the quark mass, UCD Lagrangian has this large globe symmetry. However, in the real world, those symmetry, they are realized differently. Chiral symmetry is a spontaneous breaking to SU3 because of the QCD vacuum. The corresponding eight symmetry breaking freedom, there are eight massless golden stone bosons, which is identified as a pion, kion, and the eta eight. The second, the another one is the action symmetry is explicitly breaking the so-called chiral anomaly. The one coupling to the electromagnetic field that is give major responsibility to the two photon decay of those mesons. The second one, which is coupling to gluon field, that will give mass up to the pi eta zero, even in the chiral limit. Now we know the quark, they actually have mass, and not only that, they, the mass, they are different. So those uh, chiral symmetry and SU symmetry, they're all explicitly broken. So all those golden stone bosons, they are actually massive. And also the, the particle we observe in the laboratory, they're actually mixing up the 
QCD eigenstate. So th uh, therefore, we this system, Pi0808 prime, really provide us a rich laboratory to study the symmetry structure of QCD at low energy. So in the last uh, almost two decades, um, PrimeX collaboration developed this uh, comprehensive program to measure Pi0808 prime and using primitive defect. So this program have two parts. The first part is measured to photon decay width. And second part is a measured transition form factor is focused on the space-like region, small Q-square. So to using those measurements to address the broad interesting physics questions. And if A to go, uh, pi zero go to two gamma, this already done at six GeV, which is highlighted in red. And A to goes to two gamma decay width is a, in, in blue is currently ongoing. The rest of them is on black, is uh, still coming in the pipeline in the near future. So in the rest of my talk, I will mostly focus on these uh, two, uh, pi zero uh, and eta two gamma decay width. And this process is uh, directly, mostly is due to chiral anomaly, which is described this, um, by this very famous triangle diagram. In the chiral limit, this can be predicted exactly, and uh, which is, as you can see here, this uh, decay width is only depending on fundamental parameter. Here, the uncertainty is shown here is only due to the experimental uncertainty coming from the pion decay constant, which is extracted from the charred pion decay. So this is give us uh, a median order prediction. Now, if you go to a high order, introduce a, the, the quark mass, and this quantity, the eta, the pi zero two gamma decay, this is one of the very unique um, quantity in the confinement region of QCD that can be calculated precisely. So in the past uh, um, 15 years, there are two different experiment approach. One is based on the chiral perturbation theory, three different calculations, as you can see, this color band, they, they're all consistent with each other with um, precision of the 1%. The second approach in using QCD sum rule, again, is showing this blue band, again, is very precise. So therefore, this is give us a unique opportunity to test no energy QCD prediction. Now, if you look at the, the particle data book at time in, this is a 2010 before PrimeX, the experiment data is very dispersive. There's no enough sensitivity to test the theory. So therefore, that give us a, a motivation to have a new primitive measurement in order to really have a, something to test and um, the theory prediction. So the method what we're using is uh, using primitive is real photon interact with a virtual photon in the coolant field of the nuclei to produce pi zero. The cross section. This uh, primitive crossing is directly associated with uh, two gamma decay width. Now, this cross section actually have very unique features. It's picked a very small forward angle, have a strong beam energy dependence, and also this process is coherent process. That means the target has to remain at uh, ground state after reaction. However, in the laser, always um, uh, more complicated. Instead of exchange virtual photon, you can exchange hydronic particle that will introduce a nuclear coherent interference between these two and incoherent process. So in the experiment, what you actually measure is this blue, this black curve is sum of all different processes. The question is how you extract the primitive. The way we do that, as you can see, the different processes, they have a different angular dependence. So we can fit in the experiment data to extract the primical. Due to the nature of this measurement, that will give us a requirement on the experiment side. Since we have to measure absolute cross-section, we need to know photon flux very well. And this uh, primical cross-section has a strong beam energy dependence. So therefore, we need to know beam energy event by event. And also, the way we extract the primical is based on the angular dependence. So therefore, we need to have a good angular resolution. And also, this process is a coherent process for Primikov. So therefore, one has to be very careful to choosing 
compact nuclear target in order to make sure it's not easy to break it down. And this is the three of those show here on the right hand top. Of this picture shows the primitive measurement before Primex. And three of them, they all carried out in the 70s. Now, there are one thing in common from all this uh, previous experiment. They're using untagged photon beam and they're using conventional letter glass thermometer to measure decay photon from the pi zero. And also, when they fit in to extract the uh, primitive, they're using early theoretical calculation. So, Primex actually designed in such a way to improve all three of those. So this is the experiment set up in Hobi and um, at the 6 GeV, and we're using tagged photon beam here. This is a tagged facility that will allow us to measure the beam energy event by event, also count the number of the photon target. And uh, the Primex collaboration developed this um, pair thermometer, and um, which is allow us to control photon flux during the production run. And downstream, this uh, hybrid uh, high resolution parameter, as you can see, this we call high cal in the search central region is um, made out of the high resolution tungsten crystal. That will provide a very good um, angular resolution for the pi zero in the forward direction. And we performed two experiments, Primex 1 and Primex 2. Primex 1 was published in 2011. Primex 2 was just recently published in last, last month and with um, larger statistic about six times more than Primex 1 and also improved systematics. In the experiment, what we measure is measure the incident photon beam energy time and also for the decay photon, we're using the high cal to measure the energy timing and reconstruct the position for each de um, decay photons. Here on the left bottom, the two-dimensional plot, x-axis shows reconstructed two photon inverse mass. Y-axis is a elasticity, is basically energy conservation, the total energy sum of the two decay photon over the beam energy. So what we are interested in is the, inelast the elastic pi zero, which is instead of this ellipse. So what we do is using two different methods done by different independent group, to ex extract the pi zero yield. One is using energy constraint. Second method is using so-called hybrid mass, uh, which is instead of uh, you project to the immersed mass, on, uh, we project to this uh, diagonal axis to extract uh, pi zero. So this, both of this way in the major goal is minimize the contamination from inelastic pi zero. Here, this shows the differential cross-section for Primex 1 and Primex 2. And, as, and then what we do is using the new theoretic calculation for the different and the, the angular dependence for different uh, process to fit in the experiment data to extract the primitive. As you can see in this, uh, those picture, the forward direction, this red dash line, this is a primitive. So in order to control overall systematics, we're also using the same experiment setup to measure fundamental QED process, electron compton scattering. And that will allow us uh, to control the systematics. Here, this is on the right-hand side, show the data point is um, our experiment result. And this uh, solid curve is uh, next to leading order theory prediction, as you can see, experiment data and theory uh, agree with each other very well. So therefore that give us confidence we are able to control the systematics for the cross-section at percentage level. And here this one shows, the table shows the breakdown of the um, error budget for different contribution. And the total error buffer of Primex 1 is at a 0.6% level. Here is this, this is a final result, just as I said earlier, it's recently published on science. The first, uh, uh, first five points are currently listed in the particle data book. The fifth, fifth one is the Primex 1 result. And then this uh, sixth point is the Primex 2 result. As you can see, we improve our previous result about a factor of two improvement. And the last one, which is in red, this is the final result. We combine Primex 1 and Primex 2. 
and with the error, total error bar at 1.5%. And this result is clearly we uh, is consistent with the leading order chiral anomaly prediction. However, if you compare with uh, the high order QCD calculation, our result is about two sigma below. So this is really cause for explanation. So now I'm going to move on to the eta to gamma decay width measurement. And on the left hand side, this is show the current status. The, the, the data in blue is in the particle data book. All those results is measured by e, using the E plus E minus uh, collider uh, facility to do the measurement. The pink point is a previous primitive measurement by Cornell collaboration. As you can see, they are systematically different uh, by more than three sigma. Here, our major goal for the uh, PrimeX ADA experiment is used to perform new primitive measurement at about 3% level in order to resolve this uh, discrepancy between different uh, experimental approach. The result from this experiment will directly improve uh, the extraction, the eta eta prime mixing angle. So here on the right hand side shows if you're using collider average compared with using corner primitive measurement, and that is where the mixing angle was standing, and we are able to improve this, not only the error bar and also resolve this systematic difference. On the other hand, the in the particle data book, all the partial decay width of the eta is normalized to the eta two gamma decay. So therefore, by having to improve eta two gamma decay width, that will have a broad impact. Basically, you will improve all the other partial decay width. The one of the example is the eta three pi. So this process is uh, goes through the isospin violation, even due to the uh, either due to the quark mass difference or the electromagnetic interaction. So electromagnetic interaction, the contribution is very small, is well known for many years because of the G parity. So therefore, the eta three pi really provide us a clean probe to access the quark mass ratio. This Q here is defined on, on the top right. So in the experiment side, however, as, as I mentioned earlier, the eta three pi decay width is using eta two gamma decay as input. And then you're using well-known branching ratio to calculate eta three pi decay. So therefore, in this sense, eta two gamma decay will play very significant role in the quark mass ratio determination. Here on the left, the hand side of this plot shows if you're using collider average and the corner primitive, and that is what is the uh, Q value you got. And here is a presented um, our proposed experiment that will resolve this difference. On the right hand side of this plot shows that one also can extract the quark mass ratio using KM mass difference. However, this method you have to do the electromagnetic correction. So in the different theory calculation on the electromagnetic correction that will give you uh, introduce model dependence. As you can see, they give a different Q value. One thing I want to point out is re recently using lattice QCD calculation, this uh, electromagnetic correction from the lattice QCD. Now then the, you determine this Q value. As you can see, it's kind of the disagree with uh, uh, one using this uh, coronary, uh, the collider average to calculate uh, the Q value from using it, uh, from the eta three pi decay, and it's more consistent with the uh, prim the previous uh, primitive uh, uh, value. So therefore, that to give us more motivation to have a new measurement in order to resolve this issue because quark mass ratio is one of the fundamental parameter in standard model, and as we hear, just one example to the quark mass ratio will affect many other things. One of the things is associated with this uh, uh, couple angle, which is also very important for the uh, test of the CKM utility. So now I wanted to go to the experiment side. Compared with pi zero, eta mass is about a factor of a four larger. So that will introduce a more experiment challenge because the cross section immediately getting smaller. And also the Pimikov peak will push it to the large angle will have more overlap with the nuclear coherent. And also the momentum transfer to the nuclear will be larger. So therefore one has to concern about this uh, to maintain the coherency and also the, the final state interactions, many other issues. 
In order to address this, uh, we have a two different approach. One is go to high energy. So that is why we wait on KO12 GeV. As you can see, the high energy, then you can increase the cross section and also go to high energy beat in the, the that will help us to separate the primicofer from the uh, hydronic background because of different E dependence. And also the momentum transfer to the nuclear will get smaller. So therefore, less concern to the many other issues. The second approach we use in chosen light target. So the light target then immediately, the, usually they are more compact, so it's not easy to break up. And also for the light target, as you can see, the nuclear coherent peak is pushed to the large angle. So therefore, that will help us to separate the primical from the background. And also, most of those uh, light targets will have a well-known form factor. So based on these, we chosen two targets. One is hydrogen and helium-4. Helium-4 will have a larger primical for cross-section because of the z-square dependence. And this is ongoing experiment uh, in whole D. And what we do is using the standard uh, GLUEX apparatus. The only addition thing we add is uh, this count out uh, color meter, which is behind FCAL. As you can see here in this right hand side picture, made out of a 12 by 12 lead tungsten crystal. So the purpose of this one is in combined with the forward color meter FCAL in order to measure the electron content scattering during the production run in order to control the systematics. Current studies for this experiment, we can we construct CompCal and uh, there's we had uh, engineering run in two, uh, fall 2018. And in spring 2019, we took a, a first production run. And here, the, this pie chart shows the distribution of the beam time. We took uh, some data of, uh, on the brilliant target, to just the, uh, that's calibration target, provide a point like target and to do the calibration. And then we spent the rest of the time on the helium target, and that's for the production. So we took, during this round period, we took about 50% of the data on the helium-4 target. So in the next, uh, the rest of I, the, in the second one is scheduled uh, in 2021, as uh, Bob mentioned yesterday morning. So here, is it, this is a very preliminary result from our phase one um, data. And here on the left hand side shows the eta yield and uh, the x axis, the angular, uh, the eta production angle. On the right hand side, that is the, are the theory prediction, as you can see, and expect to see a, a forward direction, this primitive peak. And clearly from our data, we can clearly see the primitive peak. And this is the result that shows uh, the extracted Compton cross section. And again, on the right, left hand side is on the helium target. Uh, one, this is one run only. And uh, as the red is uh, the NIST uh, theory prediction. So on the right hand side is a brilliant target with uh, much more statistics. And uh, the, again, red curve is uh, the NIST the prediction. So up to this point, and uh, we, the, the result is compared, compared with the theory is agree with um, each other within a few, uh, few, several percent level. And we are continuous working on that. As obviously, you can see there are some issues that still remain. So there we are working on that. So this is um, this project project is a current ongoing, and uh, we expect to have a new data coming up. So next, I'm going to switch to the transition form factor measurement. As I said, we are going to measure the transition form factor in this space-like region. And for those kind of the measurement, instead of the using photon beam, that will require to have an electron beam in order to uh, access the Q square. And so our major focus is on the small Q square region. That will allow us to model independently extract the slope, which is uh, corresponding the interaction radian of the, the pi zero eta eta prime. So on the other hand, the measurement of the transition form factor will provide a timely input 
for the hydronic light by light calculation for the muonic T minus two. And so here, the, um, as we know, the transition fork type for the G minus two calculation, they require to have all different kinematics reaching. However, as pointed out by our theory colleagues, and the, the small Q square have much more weight, which is shown on this uh, bottom left uh, figure. So the dominant contribution is from the small Q square region. So on the right hand side, this middle uh, plot shows the current status for the space like um, measurement for the pi zero transition form factor. As you can see, and the existing data, they are mostly have, still have relatively large Q square. And there's no data at all for the small Q square below less than 0.3 GV square. So uh, here, the bottom picture shows them for the for us, where our target will reach to small Q square in order to fill this experimental gap. So uh, currently, we are we already submitted this um, letter of intent to, to the PAC uh, 48 to develop this uh, transition form factor on the PI zero. Similar situation for the eta eta prime, which is coming later on in the future. So before I go to my conclusion, I wanted to say a few words about uh, another ongoing um, optim uh, activity in whole D. And this is also using the primical process to produce the pion pair and in either charged pion or the neutral pion. This will allow to measure the pion polarizability. So they already have one proved experiment on the charred pion, and there's a new proposal just recently submitted to the PAC-48 for the neutral pion polarizability. So I will go to my summary page. And this, I just wanted to come, I hope I convince you this um, primical for this uh, program um, on this uh, pi zero eta eta prime measurement is a, uh, is a uh, is quite a, com a comprehensive program and is actually developed in the last two decades already and it will allow us to address uh, many of those very important questions in the low energy qcd so the pi zero to gamma decay with uh, we just uh, uh, finish and and publish the result and the, the precision is uh, as what we initially projected is a 1.5 Total uncertainty is uh, currently represent the best measurement in this fundamental parameter. And also our result also calling for some attention to understand why our result is uh, uh, kind of the systematically below the high order QCD prediction. So currently we are con going to, uh, to working on this eta 2 gamma decay width and it's in process. And we're going to continue to develop the rest of the program in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I had just one question, but you show the results for uh, Prime X1 and Prime X2, the, the combined result of the two experiments. Uh, it, it seemed like the error bar didn't didn't decrease. In fact, it seemed like maybe it, I don't know, just on the plot, it seemed like maybe it increased slightly uh, in combining yeah. the two results. I just, I, I understand well, the statistics from the first one weren't that good, but. Okay, yeah, actually decreased a little bit, but this is not visible because some of the thing is, uh, you can, uh, is not complete because of, um, uh, not, some of this uh, error bar is not completely independent. For example, the theory. Uh, contribution, so therefore, but slightly decrease I compared see. with okay. primates. It's just a visual effect. If you look yeah. at the the primates two, the total error bar is a, the exact number is a 1.57 percent. So this one will say 1.50. So it's hard to see. Okay, thank you. All right, that was an excellent talk. Thank you to all the speakers uh, in the session, and especially. Uh, thank you to everyone for keeping on time, uh, because uh, the next thing, of course, is the session coming up. Uh, and uh, so, Liping, if you could uh, just stop sharing your screen, uh, because uh, we're going to have a short uh, presentation by Amy Schertz. So, uh, Amy, uh, together with, with Lorelei,
just did a tremendous amount of work uh, on putting this poster session together, and we really have a record number, uh, and it's especially uh, nice in this format. Uh, and so she's going to, uh, Amy is the uh, graduate student representative on the JLU board, uh, and uh, she's going to give everyone information about how the poster session is going to work uh, and some other details. So, Amy, go ahead and uh, share your screen whenever you're ready. And unmute your microphone. Yes, hi. Um, all right. So, uh, we're about to kick off the 2020 virtual poster session, which um, is really exciting. So, we have 24 posters this year, which I think is a record number. And we, and those posters represent students from 14 different institutions. Um, and so we have all of the posters listed at this link. If one of the moderators can drop it in the chat, that would be great. So you'll see a page with thumbnail versions of all the posters with their titles and, um, and the names of the presenters. So you can click the thumbnails to see full size versions of the posters. You can click the titles to watch the YouTube presentations. And we have two spaces for you to discuss the posters and presentations. So if you just want to say, hey, this poster is really great. Everyone should go and check it out. Um, that's something that should go probably in the Slack. So if someone can drop the join Slack link in the chat too, that would be awesome. Um, we have, there's a special channel just for the, this meeting and especially for the poster session. So that's JLUO 2020. And then if you have a specific question for the presenter, um, that's usually best to put in the YouTube comments and that'll be preserved for posterity. Then we'll um, announce the winners during the JSA award session on Wednesday. So tomorrow morning around 11.15. And then I just want to thank all of our judges. Like we could not pull this off without a small army of judges and Thank you to everyone who's judging. Thank you to everyone who entered. And especially thank you to Lorelai, who I could not have pulled this off without. All right. Um, let's go look at some posters. Thanks very much, Amy. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, who uh, attended today. Uh, and thank you to all the presenters uh, from today. So uh, grab your favorite uh, beverage and uh, we will see you uh, in the poster session. Thanks everyone.